Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Christine Chan, Senior Investment Specialist at the Asian Development Bank, focusing on private sector infrastructure financings. I'm currently working remotely from San Francisco, and thank you for tuning in from around the world. We have a very dynamic session in store for you today. Now, ASEF has been an amazing experience this past week. You have heard a lot about the impacts of COVID-19 and how we can build our climate resilience across the energy sectors. Now we will take a tour to explore COVID-19's impact in other key economic sectors, such as transport, building, waste, and financial services, and how we can drive policies, stimulus, and innovations to fight both the pandemic and pollution. Now to kickstart, I would like to introduce our scene setter, Antonio Della Paye. Antonio is a senior energy expert and client director at McKinsey and Company. A chartered chemical engineer, Antonio brings over 20 years of experience across refining, petrochemicals, LNG and power industries, advising on energy markets, energy outlook, energy policies, business improvements, portfolio optimization and corporate strategy. Antonio holds a, chem a degree in chemical engineering from the University of La Aquila, Italy. He also attended the supply chain management program at NCAD Business School in Singapore. Now joining us from the Lion City, Antonio will set the stage for us with riveting insights on how we can best utilize green stimulus and implement sector-wide initiatives towards a decarbonized post-crisis recovery. With that, I would like to invite Antonio. Thank you, Christine, for uh, the introduction. Um, okay, I, I would like uh, to thank uh, ADB for inviting McKinsey to share facts insight on the possibility of a post-COVID-19 economic stimulus that also furthers global decarbonization. This is important. The analysis is based on public available data and in light of rapidly evolving conditions, these materials are provided as is. As we know, things change very rapidly in this period. Well, let's highlight the fact that COVID-19 is first and foremost a humanitarian challenge. COVID-19 has affected communities on multiple continents. People are dying and losing jobs. Solving the humanitarian challenge is a top priority. Much remains to be done globally to respond and recover, from counting the humanitarian cost of the virus to supporting the victims and families to developing a vaccine. This is important that we remind this before we start to talk more. In the next 10 minutes, we talk on how COVID-19 has transformed the world and where the economy is and where the policymakers forward looking to stimulate the economic activity is. With the all announced stimulus, the post-crisis recovery is a moment of use it or lose it for the climate. Climate change was there pre-COVID, it will be there post-COVID. The stimulus needs to be supportive initiatives that deliver jobs in the short, medium and long term, preferably in industry that will thrive in the future. Measures also need to be efficient from a decarbonization perspective, reflect the best pathways to net zero in the relevant sector. Also, the financing needs to be carefully designed to deliver the right balances of fiscal tools and regulatory pushes to make change happen. This needs to be all together. In this slide, we are showing the European Union case, but it's true for all regions countries. The recession is forecast to be worse than many historical comparators. We are into uncharted territory. So this is a starting point. As just mentioned, we, we are on horizon two. Sorry, on the slides. They're thinking about recovering. While policymakers are in the horizon three that are thinking about what's in the future. So if we look at the post COVID-19 time recovery, could help advance the climate agenda in three ways. One, have a green stimulus. Recovery package could be leveraged to target both economical and environmental impact. Two, capture this moment to change, modify policies. And three, the new normal has brought fundamental behavior changes. So governments could take action to make the positive ones stick in the new normal. For example, what about remote working? 
here we see our benchmarking of stimulus action taken by 54 countries around the world. They show significant variation in the size of the response with some countries committing to spend as much as 40% of GDP. This is a huge commitment. Now, if we look into more details to one of the announced stimulus, we can see that China is focusing on $5 trillion stimulus over five years period at developing technology, energy, and transportation infrastructure across all the provinces. And many other countries are doing similar things. We did say to design an effective green stimulus requires three steps. First step, understand the scale and nature of a social and economic impact. Second, identify prioritize green stimulus levers. And third, implement with the right mix of push and pull mechanism. In the next few pages, we will provide a bit more details on these three steps. The first step, to understand the scale and nature of social economic impact, we use a case study for Europe. Well, the methodology applies to any region. The sector's impact may be slightly different, but the concept remains the same. For example, 50% of all jobs at short-term risk in Europe are in three sectors, namely customer service, food service, and buildings. This is important when considering the design of stimulus packages that may support the most affected sectors or reskill, retrain of people from the most affected sectors to emerging sectors, to other sectors. Also, when designing a stimulus package, there must be some sort of top-down approach. It is important to identify game-changing flagship initiatives in the main sectors. In the example here, if you look on the left-hand side, I would say the flagship projects apply equally to developed and developing countries, with some exception maybe for the hydrogen shipping the aviation sectors. It must be highlighted that the role of the flagship project initiatives is to set a clear direction. So this is important to have flagship initiatives. At the same time, we realize that for each sector, there will be an ample portfolio of project. It is important to identify and prioritize green stimulus levers. To do so, uh, McKinsey introduced a set of indicators covering both the economical impact and the decarbonization impact to allow a screening, a selection of the most impactful project. For the economical impact, in the indicators are number of jobs created per million spent, GDP or GDBA multiplier, benefit towards each skill groups, benefit towards each sector or geography, and speed of impact. For speed of impact, we mean uh, time between money is invested and the time economy sees the impact. If I give an example of wind turbine, we may need to wait two years for permits to be in place before work starts, while air conditioning buildings has an immediate impact. Installation happens as investment goes out. For the decarbonization indicator, we have three indicators. It's tone CO2 per year, remove the per year, enabling potential, and decarbonization timeline. Now, let's see how do we use this indicator in a real example. So as we mentioned just now, for each sector, a long list of possible measure projects will need to be assessed. This is an example. Here we show the example of surface transport and how you would select the most impactful project using the indicators that we just introduced before. In this case, the project to make the top of the list would be support delivery of EV charge points, uh, local urban rail, rail system, and implement active transport solution. But I think you got, you know, you need to have a strong methodology indicators. We said a few, a few times that uh, to design an effective green stimulus, the third step is the implementation using the right mix of push and pull mechanisms. The pull interventions accelerate activities through funding, through tax breaks, subsidies, or direct funding. And the push interventions catalyze change through regulations. For example, requiring all players to meet a certain standard. Let's give a real example. Let's look at building energy efficiency. The pool could be provide direct funding to retrofit residential property through grants for efficient air conditioning, for example. And the push would be to require residential properties to have a certain minimum energy rating and ban the use of an efficient air conditioning from a target date. So this is a, an example to give you an idea of pool and push mechanism. Well, McKinsey has carried out an analysis of stimulus options across four sectors industry, buildings, energy, and transport in one European country. Their analysis illustrates the possibility of assembling a balanced 
effective low carbon stimulus program. By our estimates, deploying 75 to 150 billion euros would produce 100 to 150 billion euros of gross value added, create up to 3 million new jobs, mainly in sectors and demographic categories where jobs are highly vulnerable, and support a 15 to 30% reduction in carbon emission by 2030. This is possible. Okay, finally, we should remind ourselves that the implementation of new investments will face operational challenge in the early days of the new normal, such as fiscal distancing. This will put limits on uh, assembly, on constraints on uh, size of teams, supply chain. This will continue to be disrupted. Declining corporate and consumer spending may slow adoption on new products, services. A lower price environment may magnify the cost differences between green and gray options. Well, I reached the end of my presentation and I'm looking forward uh, to an engaging Q&A session. And uh, thank you, Christine, back to you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much, Antonio. I'm a, hu I'm a huge fan of McKinsey Insights and we're really delighted to have you share your perspectives with us. Um, I think you have a way to, you know, help us distill a lot of, you know, complex issues that we're coping with uh, during this pandemic into very simple, clear um, frameworks into how we can really consider and prioritize different ways to drive stimulus going forward. And, and also thinking about how we can retool um, our workforce. Um, I think the COVID pandemic has really you know, brought out opportunities for us to uh, develop new skills, such as you know, how to operate a Zoom meeting. You know, that, that's really uh, introduced new uh, technologies to all of our uh, colleagues. So next, I'd like to introduce um, uh, our next speaker, um, Mr. Rajashi Sahai. Um, he has a very interesting presentation in the sustainable mobility sector. Now, Mr. Sahai is the Chief Business Officer of Adaptive City Mobility, a German four-wheeler electric vehicle-based mobility solution that aims to make mass electric mobility possible now without fast chargers. Mr. Sahai has deep expertise in the mobility sector, spanning smart cities, public transport, mobility as a service, shared services, and electric automobiles. He has worked in public as well as private sector in Asia and Europe, including as the Managing Director for Traffi in Asia and India General Manager of OFO Shared Bicycles. Now from the Dutch city of Amsterdam, Mr. Sahai will now transport us into the future of mobility, where COVID-19 has literally driven up all kinds of deliveries from groceries to passengers. So I'm really keen to hear Rajashi share with us from Europe. Over to you, Rajashi. Thank you, Christine. Um, good morning to all from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, I'm Rajeshri Rakesh Sahai. I uh, work as the Chief Business Officer of Adaptive City Mobility. We are a German electric mobility startup with its roots in uh, a successful German government lighthouse project for electric mobility. Uh, interestingly, in the photograph, uh, you see the German Minister for Economy and Energy, Mr. Peter Altemeyer. So we all know that uh, the key to mobility contributing to the Paris Agreement goals is uh, mass scale electrification of vehicle fleets. But it's not uh, as easily said as done. The world does not have enough fast chargers to support a massive shift to electric mobility, leading us to this fundamental paradox of the sector, as I like to call it. That is, we don't have enough electric cars, nor do we have enough electric chargers to support uh, lots of electric cars. Now we understand that large scale build out of fast chargers will take uh, 10 to 30 years in uh, research rich nations of the world. Interestingly, how McKinsey likes to uh, point them. So you see the blue dots in the map. Uh, these are the resource rich nations we are talking about. Uh, that said, based on current understanding, it is economically and technically not even viable in 
rest of the world. So what is the solution of this uh, fundamental paradox that we just spoke about? Now on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, you can see the conventional approach, which has involved electrifying large and heavy cars and building fast chargers to support their massive batteries, motors, and the heft that they carry. We looked at it from a slightly different point of view. We developed a light electric car from ground up that leverages existing electricity supply in your home status, so your uh, home plugs, uh, to smartly power the future of mobility. We created a multi-purpose connected electric vehicle that works with existing energy infrastructure and range extender batteries to solve the problems of limited range, range anxiety, and charging time. So the vehicle energy solution work in tandem to deliver a complete freedom from the constraints of conventional electric cars. That said, uh, we go back to where we started, uh, mobility is delivered by fleets, and this, therefore the solution not only covers the vehicle energy aspects as you see it, but also a fleet data platform that enables fast scaling of vehicle fleets, 24 seven energy supply, high fleet utilization, and value added services. Now we aim to be a one-stop solution for all those fleet owners who want to go electric and join the mega trend, as we call it, of clean and shared mobility now. Uh, if I were to talk about the value proposition uh, that we are looking at, it's a combination of a multi-purpose vehicle, imaginative energy solution, and a smart data platform that come together to offer the cheapest running cost per kilometer, cleanest kilometer, increased asset turnover, new revenue streams, and most importantly, fast scaling of fleet businesses with existing infrastructure. Uh, and in a little bit of detail, you can see how uh, this uh, lowest uh, uh, cost uh, per kilometer is achieved with uh, a low vehicle price, uh, energy efficiency, and uh, low maintenance. Uh, coming to the uh, meat of the discussion, how uh, this also helps the carbon uh, economy. Uh, we are able to achieve 70% reduction in carbon per kilometer uh, when compared to conventional uh, vehicles and uh, even uh, up to 30% uh, reduction uh, when compared to conventional electric vehicles. Uh, moreover, there is another important part, point here that uh, with lesser materials and complexity, the vehicle is fundamentally low carbon. We are able to produce the vehicle at uh, less than 50% embedded carbon of the, that of conventional electric vehicles. Now that we have all this uh, context and uh, I hope we are on the same page, uh, let us talk about how the corona, uh, the, the pandemic affects uh, uh, this sector and uh, what we are trying to do uh, to make the most of it. Now, one mega trend as uh, Christine uh, pointed out in her introduction uh, very correctly, is that we are seeing that uh, there's a huge surge in uh, commercial fleets catering to cargo logistics. And this is, uh, this is partly because uh, we have seen uh, restrictions uh, on the passenger mobility. And we have also seen that there is a lingering discouragement in the society for passenger mobility in current times. Going forward, we expect the logistics use case primacy to continue while uh, passenger mobility for simple use cases like uh, you know, commuting to a big office where you can simply use a, a Zoom call uh, to connect with your colleagues uh, may never come back to the same levels as before, we believe. Uh, we talked about uh, asset turnover in the context slides, uh, how uh, the vehicle is able to deliver uh, a combination of uh, passenger and logistics uh, use cases. We believe that a flexible electric vehicle 
that can move people as well as goods is a great hedge for the uncertain times ahead. Another challenge that we are also seeing, particularly in Corona times, is the slump in the very demand of vehicles. Now, we see it all around us in all of our countries, uh, but this has clearly affected many industrialized nations, both in Asia and the rest of the world, where manufacturing and assembly of such vehicles takes place. Now, at ACM, we are uh, a part of a, a group of new age companies that do not, in fact, engage in manufacturing the vehicles ourselves. As a fallout of Corona, we see more excess capacity and greater willingness on the part of regional manufacturers when it comes to offering manufacturing as a service. To borrow from the seminal work of uh, Nicholas Taleb, uh, uh, anti-fragile, uh, the expected sustained excess capacity is uh, creating an anti-fragile basis for new age companies like ours and uh, essentially creating uh, more symmetry in the market uh, where uh, capacity can be shared between uh, various brands and companies. Uh, the second trend, if I were to take you to it, uh, and we're seeing is that governments are spending large portions of their budgets on fighting Corona uh, and uh, spending it on conventional sectors of the economy, uh, unlike what uh, Antonio mentioned. Uh, we do see that uh, there is in fact uh, a tendency to spend it on the macro sectors. And uh, this creates a very real possibility of uh, further delays in spending on fast charges. So what has always been a pragmatic solution for our times, uh, the whole uh, idea that I shared with you that uh, you, know, we can, you can charge the car with your home plug, uh, it becomes an even more pertinent solution for post-corona times uh, as we figure out uh, how uh, street infrastructure gets upgraded uh, with uh, so many other priorities at home. Uh, finally, I would also like to draw your attention towards crisis and their transformative influence uh, on our lives. Now, uh, some of us know the car-based taxis came about as London was having the horse manure crisis. More recently, most of us can relate to the 1970s oil crisis as the push for compact and fuel efficient cars. And uh, recently, uh, the credit crunch as the push for shared mobility. With the imminent economic slowdown, we are optimistic that we'll see more takers for our light, efficient electric mobility solution. Now, I leave you uh, with uh, a video, an excerpt of uh, the video on our website, which uh, talks about uh, the vehicle in the real world context of uh, Munich city. Cities around the world are getting more and more crowded and uh, the traffic is at a standstill and the pollution is at hazardous levels. The world needs a people's practical car adaptable to real people's real problems and helping sort out the environmental issues. Thank you. That's all from me. Uh, over to you, Christine. Thank you, Rajashi. That's really exciting um, story you shared with us in terms of how you know the COVID-19 has impacted your business and um, and transform how we continue to travel. Um, I really hope to see more sustainable mobility solutions uh, across developing Asia. Um, we really need low cost, affordable and greener transport throughout our uh, developing member countries. So ADB has um, in the past been a strong proponent of supporting sustainable transport with financing green bus leasing programs. And we really hope to see more entrepreneurial companies that we can support and finance going forward. Um, next, I would like to turn over um, to another exciting topic. We've heard a lot throughout the panel, um, throughout the ASEF conference, a lot about uh, low carbon buildings. Um, and here we have today, um, Mamet Yasilada. Uh, Mamet is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Sandscreen, which is an AI empowered tech company that is monitoring and analyzing indoor 
environmental conditions in commercial real estates. An electrical engineer by training, Mehmet is focused on developing hardware and software solutions related to building HVAC systems. Mehmet worked at Sinber Best, a collaboration amongst UC Berkeley, Go Bears, Nanyang Technological University, and the National University of Singapore to innovate on energy efficient and sustainable technologies for buildings located in the tropics. So very pertinent to, for many of our colleagues here. From the Turkish capital of Ankara, Mehmet will walk us through how sustainable buildings can utilize innovative technologies to deliver healthy and safe indoor air. With that, I'd like to invite Mehmet. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. Um, I'm Mehmet Yitjan Yeshata. I'm the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Sunscreen. We are monitoring indoor air quality data and generating uh, insights to optimize uh, ventilation and indoor air quality inside buildings. And let me explain the importance of HVAC operations in buildings with an example. At 24th of January of this year, when was the Chinese New Year Eve, people were eating lunch at restaurant in Guangzhou, China. At that day, 10 members of three different families got infected at, the, at the, that restaurant. According to Khmer recordings of the restaurant, there was no close contact between the previously infected person and the, the families. Researchers studied on this case to find responsible parameters among all usual suspects. They found that mismanaged HVAC systems of the restaurant caused that situation. At that day, ventilation was only one liter per second per person. The results show that the infection distribution is consistent with a spread pattern of indoor air contaminants. According to World Health Organization, there are two different ways of getting infections. The first one is contacting, the second one is droplets, and the last one is the most related one with building operations, airborne transmissions. Airborne transmissions refers to the presence of microbes within droplets, nuclei, nuclei which are generally considered particles that are smaller than five microns. These particles can remain in air for long times and they can travel inside room over long, long distances. And the next question is, who are the usual suspects in our buildings? We have many usual suspects in our buildings, unfortunately. Tobacco smoke can be, gas molecules, plant spores, pollens can be our usual suspects. We have seen a lot of different ways to fight with disease in the last five months. But we until we have a vaccine, we need to optimize our HVAC operations for our buildings. And the ventilation is the most effective infection control measure inside buildings. After the first wave of the disease comes to the end, most of the world starts to come back buildings. But what is the new normal in building operations? Guidelines focused on three main parts. Firstly, regular HVAC maintenance and accurate operation. Facility management teams should be aware of their system performance and problems. System maintenance is the key part of accurate operations in buildings. The secondly, guidelines uh, emphasize on optimized ventilation. According to guidelines, 100% of outside air should be used for ventilation. Before new normals, facility, facilities were mixing the exhaust air that is collected inside buildings with outside air for ventilation due to the energy efficiency concerns. But it's not possible in this situation because this can cause carrying the virus every part of the building. But energy efficiency is not that in buildings. Uh, facility management team can analyze their occupancy and they can lower the speed of their system at, on weekends or at nights. The third emphasis of guidelines, guidelines is about humidity of indoor environments. Increased humidity may prevent evaporation of the droplet, and this decreases the chance of circulation. That's why humidity should be kept between 40 and 60%. Guidelines recommend us many different actions. These actions can prevent the spread of virus very, very effectively. But the question is, are our buildings ready for these actions? Buildings are not like our cars or like our mobile phones or not like our computers. Buildings have almost 50 years of lifetime. Since the nature of buildings, they are very conservative for adapting new technologies. 
ASHRAE guidelines present major challenges for 72% of buildings that are over 20 years old. Despite the marketing around intelligent buildings, digital twins, or big data, the COVID crisis showed us that we even don't have very fundamental data in our buildings. For example, most of facility management teams don't have any record of their room's air quality, humidity, or even their temperature. How can you optimize the parameter even you don't measure it? The solution goes around cost-effective and easily configured solutions. Solutions should be integrated easily into our buildings. And increasing numbers of low-cost, low-power hardware variety, improvements on data analysis tools, uh, improvements on machine learning and cloud computing can help to increase solutions that is used to fight with COVID-19. Let me give some examples of these solutions. I will start with some IoT applications. Uh, firstly, let me explain the system performance measurement. There are some sensors that measures energy consumption and vibration of HVAC equipments. And these devices can measure, the, can measure and indicate the performance of the equipment by using these data. Thanks to the integration between these devices and cloud environments, facility management teams can follow the performance of the equipment with real-time data on their mobile phone or on their computer. Now let's dive into the indoor air quality monitoring. At the first era of indoor air quality monitoring, there were only handheld devices. Handheld devices, was, handheld devices were so accurate, but they were so expensive. And since they don't have any network connection or system integration, they can be only used for recording or logging issues. After that, comp companies like Siemens or Schneider uh, started to produce wired air quality sensors. Uh, they can be connected into the building management system by using uh, protocols like Modbus, Parknet, but they were really accurate, but they were uh, still expensive and they are not scalable. They, need, they require many installation works around buildings. But after that, the total wireless sensors came into the market. They are cheap, scalable, and flexible. They can be set up on 50 floor buildings only in an hour. And since they are very flexible, uh, many different parameters can be measured with these kind of sensors. Thanks to the simple network architecture of these sensors, they can easily integrate it, easily and quickly integrate it into mobile or web dashboard. As I said before, we will have many sensors that generate data from all over the building. The next question is that, how will we use the data to fight with COVID-19? Cloud computing and artificial intelligence gives us many opportunities to generate insights for making our buildings more healthy and more efficient. I will give, give some examples about it. Different factors like building materials, bed filtration, office furniture, cigarettes can cause bad air quality. Detecting the source of pollutants would be very helpful for facility management to optimize indoor air quality inside buildings. It is possible by mimicking our nose with data analysis tools by using indoor air quality sensor data. The second application is anomaly detec detection. Uh, sometimes going over certain threshold can be fatal inside buildings. Therefore, it should be detected before going to that point. It can be about temperature of the room, humidity of the room, air quality of the room, or energy consumption of the room. Facility management will be notified by understanding system behavior with animal detection. Our third, our, my third example is predictive maintenance. If systems are broken inside buildings, that can cost a lot of money because stopping the operations can have domino effect in whole business. That's why maintenance time will be analyzed and facility teams will be notified before system broken by using predictive maintenance. In my, in my final slide, please remember my first slide, the restaurant case, number of people, occupants of people, occupancy matters to optimize ventilation. It can be detected by analyzing the sensor data and it can be very helpful to optimize our ventilation. As I told during my presentation, uh, new technologies like IoT, 
machine learning and artificial intelligence will be key factor for fighting with COVID-19. Thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you so much, Mehmet. I think um, you, you know what you have equipped us with in terms of you know, um, ensuring our safety and peace of mind as we re-enter buildings, um, uh, going into the new uh, cold, dry season with the upcoming fall and winter months coming. Um, you know, tech, how we can leverage innovative technologies to monitor our indoor air quality. It's so important during this time. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Khalid Basun from one of my most uh, favorite sectors where I've done uh, financing in, in waste uh, to energy infrastructure. Um, Khalid is the founder of Econos, a company focused on the circular economy, resource management, and resource to energy. Khalid has been introducing innovative ideas to recycle and promote circular economies, including the first hazardous waste to energy plant and the first municipal solid waste to refuse derived fuel to energy plant in Malaysia. Khalid oversaw operations in Southeast Asia and India as the managing director at Mardak and was appointed honorary counsel of Sierra Leone to Malaysia. And he was active in fundraising during the Ebola crisis. From Kuala Lumpur, Khalid will now showcase how we can minimize pollution and prevent reinfection with innovative microwave technologies to treat medical waste, which has spiked from COVID-19. With that, welcome, Khalid. Hi, good afternoon, everybody from uh, Kuala Lumpur. Thanks, Christine, for the introduction and ADB for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I would just go through uh, some slides um basically to describe uh medical infectious infectious waste and the possible changes and comparison of technologies and then the impact of uh, this uh, following the covid 19 uh, epidemic so first we need to understand what is um, infectious hazardous waste and this typically comes from uh, the hospitals um, and it contains blood and other bodily fluids human tissues, organ fluids, body parts, and sharps, sharp waste, which comes from basically the syringes, needles, and the disposable materials from hospitals and clinics, which also includes the sharp bins where these uh, needles are placed. And of course, during the COVID-19 uh, 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 epidemic, there was a vast increase in, uh, in general medical waste, uh, but also the specifically mask, gloves, and uh, PPE related to um, the caretakers um, taking care of uh, the patients. And obviously the major sources of uh, healthcare waste are uh, coming from the hospitals, laboratories, mortuaries, uh, blood banks, nursing homes, etc. cetera. And um, on average, um, in most developed countries, we produce about 0 0.5 kg of uh, hazardous waste per hospital bed per day. And in other countries, um, or less uh, low income countries, the waste production is about 0 0.2 kg. But unfortunately, uh, there are additional waste sort of mixed up because um, in this stream, uh, because the separation uh, discipline is not as good as, uh, um, as, as some of the developed countries. Basically, we look at the objective. What is the objective of treating um, uh, medical waste? And th that is basically to ensure that we have a safe and environmentally a friendly management option and for protecting the hazards in terms of collection, handling, storing, transportation, and treating the disposed waste. Um, that there are in many countries very strict rules how these are dealt with and in Malaysia um, we have uh, the Environment Quality Act which basically governs how uh, medical waste should be disposed of. 
And then we look at the types of treatment you have for uh, medical waste. And um, traditionally, there is uh, incineration, which is uh, basically just burning the medical waste and uh, producing uh, which the residue will be ash. But over the years, um, uh, developments have occurred looking at uh, different methodologies of uh, treating the waste, which um, go around the sterilization process. And uh, that's found in uh, systems such as the microwave, autoclave, and ste steam treatments. Um, and from WHO's perspective and view, they see that wherever feasible, um, sound treatment of hazardous waste uh, by autoclaving or microwaving is preferred. And uh, um, that is preferred over uh, incineration of medical waste and where possible to use as little resources as possible in terms of uh, water, electricity. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see uh, just some pictures of a microwave uh, um, system and an autoclave system. So during the um, COVID-19 epidemic, obviously there was a major increase um, in uh, the production of medical waste. And um, you needed to have systems that could take care of this increase of volume based on the existing infrastructure that, the, that existed. Um, so you needed more treatment facilities because of the sudden increase. And the, the difficulty um, uh, many countries uh, found was the challenge of how do we get new equipment in fast um, to ensure that we can treat the medical waste. And obviously, um, most countries were looking for the fast deployment, flexibility of equipment, and fast installation and training. Generally, um, some cement uh, kilns can actually take uh, medical waste. And um, th um, this was a possibly a quick solution to resolve the medical waste uh, increase. And uh, many uh, uh, companies and countries thought about using uh, this as a possible solution. However, if we look at um, the reality, um, although the cement kilns can handle medical waste and after it's treated, it becomes no longer infectious, um, it is, it is uh, recommended uh, that you should treat the medical waste prior to it being fed into such cement kilns. Uh, so most countries and regulations uh, regulate the, the, the flow from uh, raw medical waste directly into cement kilns. However, if we were to look at possibilities in such events that uh, we have uh, now for the future, uh, as long as the medical waste is, has been treated and sanitized, then the contamination uh, prior to feeding into the cement kilns is reduced, and then therefore this would be a good uh, op option. Um, to modify such cement kilns to receive such waste or, uh, does take time and does have a cost, but this is a potential solution. And uh, RDF and SRF from the medical waste, which has a very high CV, can be fed into the kilns um, as an alternative fuel. So we, we looked at different uh, possibilities of different technologies and we um, compared uh, practically what is the uh, sort of uh, recommended, uh, potential recommended solution. And um, we compared the microwave and autoclave um, processes. And we found that through a report um, by Klaus Zimmermann, that actually the, the microwave uh, did prove to be um, slightly better than autoclave because it, it reduced uh, water use and uh, also the costing uh, in, in terms of costs, um, microwave is slightly cheaper. So when we consider technologies, we have to look at, you know, the technology maturity, is it proven, uh, the affordable capex and opex of such a technology, the ease of use, 
and then what do you do with the residue after you 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 uh, you processed with the regulations to ensure that the, these technologies meet regulations and key findings from the COVID-19 is, you know, do we have fast deployment, uh, uh, flexibility of siting equipment, and fast installation and training? WHO and UN um, have recommended uh, the use of technologies that don't consume valuable resources such as electricity, fuel, and water. So this is a technology review, uh, again, uh, by the Zimmerman report. And you can see um, in terms of uh, cost effectiveness and also um, ease of use, water usage, um, the, the microwave technology did prove to be uh, cheaper and friendlier and more cost effective. Other, look, other sort of processes we looked at is what, what else could we do with this residue? Uh, after its process, either from a microwave or an autoclave. And there, the, the, the sort of traditional options would be to go through a pyrolysis, uh, plastic to oil, SRF, RDF cement kiln, a, a waste to energy plant, sanitary landfills in some countries and secured landfills in other countries. Um, we then looked at, you know, what, what, what can happen with the, in, in terms of uh, reducing this residue um, and, and one of the options we looked at was a pyrolysis system to oil. So about 60% of the residue from medical waste process actually is uh, plastic and therefore can be recycled. And this is just a flow chart of a microwave system um, and, and the way uh, it, it operates. And uh, we, these are the benefits and uh, advantages of using the microwave uh, technology. Key things is reduction of uh, volume from 80 to 80% 80 to 15%, uh, easy installation. Um, machines like this can be installed within one week from, this, from uh, dispatch. And this is a case study in Malaysia where we actually shipped uh, um, within 30 days from fabrication. These are ready stock, installation in 10 days. So the whole process took only 40 days. Um, however, if you're starting from manufacturing um, all the way to installation, it will be about 80 days. So to prepare for the future, these are the readiness for fast deployment. All countries, I think, must identify technology and suppliers. And must, we must encourage regional manufacturing of technology for fast deployment and developing regional expertise, flexible technology, capacity available that meets the needs, ease of siting and ease of operations. Thank you very much. And I hand over back to Christine. Thank you so much, Khalid, for sharing with us you know, this really interesting uh, technology. In, in a lot of ways, I think it dispels a lot of myths that we have in terms of, um, you know, the significant costs associated with building, you know, resilient waste infrastructure. As a matter of fact, with what you shared with us, you can actually um, get countries, equip countries with uh, being able to prepare for the next pandemic uh, with such uh, microwave technologies that are affordable and low cost. And tying that back with uh, the work that ADB has been doing in the uh, medical waste sector as part of ADB's COVID response, uh, we have um, published a set of guidelines uh, regarding how countries can um, find the resources and access information regarding uh, suppliers regarding medical waste. So we're really excited to have you join our panel today and look forward to further discussing this really important topic Next up, we have Mr. Sridhar Pandey. Mr. Pandey is the founder and managing director of Elecoref Energy, which provides innovative battery solutions. Mr. Pandey has hands-on experience in the lithium battery and smart metering industry and has published in international journals and holds two process patents. He holds a bachelor's degree in electronics and communications engineering from VTU in Karnataka. From Gujarat, India, Mr. Pandey 
will showcase how Gujarat's international finance tech city, Gift City, India's very first smart city and global financial tech hub, has been operating under the new normal while leveraging its resilient smart city infrastructure. With that, welcome, Mr. Pandey. Thank you, Christine. Uh, good, good morning to all. I'm Sridhar Pandey, and I'm working as a director at Electra Energy Private Limited. We are the manufacturer of lithium batteries and energy storage systems. So today I'm going to discuss about Gift City Gujarat and its COVID-19 impacts. So if we talk about India, the financial service sector is emerging very fast. And we are expecting to give around 20, uh, generate around 20,000 jobs, uh, sorry, 10 to 12 million jobs by 2020. Gujarat International Financial Tech City was proposed by our Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, when he was serving as his Chief Minister of Gujarat. Gift City is a deep plant city with all the man modern features like automated uh, district cooling feature, automatic waste, waste collection, underground uh, utility systems, and uh, automated parking systems, plant sewage systems, and everything. The concept of GIST is to design a central business district between the two business hubs of uh, Gujarat, that is Ahmedabad and Gandhinagar. So uh, in the image, you can see uh, that this is the future Gift City, which was planned by government of Gujarat. In from this, around uh, eight to ten buildings are working, and others are into under the construction. Now, Gift City will serve for the next class city in terms of infrastructure development, high-rise buildings, high density population, and high uh, treating land as a pre uh, precious resources. Now. If we see, if we compare our uh, central business district with other districts all around the world, we can see uh, land area wise, if we compare, Gift City is double than other CBDs all around the world. If we compare the construction scale, it is three times larger than the La Defense Paris, five times larger than the Sijongku Japan, uh, eight times larger than the Dokya Tokyo, and double the times of Linjaku, uh, Pyudang, China. If we talk about the Green Belt area, it is 25 times larger than the La Defense Paris, larger than the Shinjuku, Tokyo, 20 times larger than the Dockyard London, and four times larger than the Pyudang, uh, New York. And if we uh, see the height wise, it is coming second high, uh, stack, uh, second number after the Luzu Pudding. Now, what are the business activities we are operating at Gift City are offshore banking, capital markets, offshore asset management, offshore insurance, IT services, and BP, BPO services. So this was the uh, just brief introduction about the Gift City. Now we will discuss the whatever, what are the opportunities we got during the COVID-19. So at the time when the entire country was under the lockdown and when the whole world is suffering because of this COVID-19, a new approval process was started at gift sales. So around 17 companies from all around the world got approval to establish their unit at gift city and start their operations. Out of 17 units, to, uh, 11 number, uh, 11 companies are from IT and I, ITS sectors. All of these unit approvals were done via teleconferencing between the government officials, sales officials, committee members, and the industrialists. When these units will be operational, the job creation numbers for the Gibbs city would be approximately 20,000 in the coming future. The different initiative was taken by the government of India for Gift City was on 29th of April, IFSC headquarters, which was going to be operated from uh, Mumbai, it is uh, transferred to 
gift city gandhinagar on 9th of may our financial minister shrimati nirmala sataraman launched rupee dollar derivative trading from gift city gandhinagar international banks from all around the world are set up in their global business service centers at gift city gandhinagar and out of them in this covid 19 around three to four international banks has already signed the agreements with the gift city the rbi the yeah, uh, rbi allows bank to trade off ndf platform at gift city ifsc gift in future will provide the jobs to many job seeker all from all around the world in the financial sector it will provide a good platform for the companies financial companies from all around the world to operate their global business service centers and their global operations with all the modern modern amenities the new normal at gift city post covid will be the first is the they will have the residential as well as uh, commercial things at a single place so the concept will be walk to work you can uh, you can stay there and you can go to your work within 5 to 10 minutes so no transportation cost will be there no transportation time wasted will be there so it will be a simple scenario like a walk to work then second thing it is a financial sector this completely uh, service sector so from the, all our people from all over the world can sit there at home and they can work remotely uh, using different uh, modes of communication that is uh, teleconferencing and uh, zoom and other applications and use a data community uh, connectivity to promote their knowledge base businesses in india thank you over to christine thank you so much mr pandey i that was a wonderful story about gujarat's uh, gift city i can't wait to visit it and i i can imagine that um uh you know gift city will bring bring forth a lot of economic growth uh for india as well as in a way that's very sustainable um and and also provide uh skills training and also opportunities to tackle climate change uh with the resilient infrastructure that um its designers uh had the foresight to incorporate um when the gift city was uh conceived so really exciting i and i really hope to to see it in person one day as well next and last but not least i would like to introduce my adb colleague kate hughes Kate has over 15 years of experience in policy, financing and technology of climate change and sustainable development, working across 19 countries in the Asia Pacific region. She recently joined ADB as a senior climate change specialist. Prior to this, Kate ran a climate change consultancy in Sydney and among other clients, consulted to the ADB for over 10 years. You're quite a veteran. Kate holds a Bachelor of Aeronautical Engineering and a Master of Engineering majoring in Energy Policy and Planning. Joining us from Sydney, Kate will share ADB's perspectives on how DMCs are developing member countries can build back better and strengthen its climate resiliency post COVID-19. With that, welcome Kate. Thank you, Christine. Um, we've heard some really excellent presentations on how COVID-19 is impacting on specific sectors, um, and I'd like to take a step back and maybe link back to our screen, um, our scene-setting presentation, and look at how climate and disaster resilience, as well as low-carbon development, can be promoted in the recovery across all sectors. Um, I heard one speaker earlier this week say that we are almost at the point where achieving the 1.5 degree temperature limit will be impossible. So how can we turn COVID-19 into an op opportunity to change this? At the same time, um, COVID has exposed systematic systematic inequality and you know underlying drivers of vulnerabilities, and highlighted the need for inclusive decision making. Um, and investing in explicit resilience building measures it's also increased our perception of risk including low probability high impact events and made a, a strong case for adopting risk informed decision making countries 
are dealing and very stretched dealing with the initial emergency response. But as they, they're now moving forward to recovery and, and longer term transformation, and we've seen that governments can make really bold decisions with significant consequences when they need to. And the decisions that they make now in recovery will create systems and institutions and assets and define development directions that will last well into the future. So these decisions need to be really good ones and ADB has an important role to play to support its developing member countries with this. You can gather a long list of potential low carbon um, and resilience recovery interventions from you know, the large amount of discourse um, on making recovery green and building back better. So what are some of the key aspects that countries need to consider when they're trying to select which interventions might work for them um, and achieve their objectives? Firstly, we, we know that recovery measures need to stabilise the economy and drive investments, but they also need to result in behavioural changes. Uh, we need to look for, for opportunities for transformation to come out of this pandemic. And this means that recovery measures need to come with the accompanying policy and capacity building and financing to manage structural changes required for, for transitioning to low carbon um, and supporting a just transition. And Antonio mentioned this when he talked about pull, push and pull levers. We also need to take account um, of the early lessons that are coming out of COVID. So it's definitely taught us consequences about preparedness um, and vulnerabilities. Also think about how COVID might impact on the possible solution. Um, or, an, or an activity. So, you know, there's solutions that are responding specifically to COVID, um, including innovative solutions. And Khaled gave us um, an excellent example of this in regards to medical waste. Uh, we then have solutions that respond to some of the lessons that COVID's exposed. And, you know, Mehmet touched on this in terms of how we might look at building uh, ventilation in, in different ways. There's solutions that have been or will be impacted by COVID, so maybe need to be implemented differently. And Rajashi gave us, um, you know, an example of this in terms of mobility and electric vehicle solutions. And then there's also a, a long list of rec uh, low carbon and resilience recovery interventions that may not be significantly impacted, but they can be accelerated or prioritised because money's being made available for recovery um, and significant amounts of recovery. Um, in some countries, as Antonia mentioned, maybe up to 40% of GDP. The critical part of the message is that, you know, in addition to climate and resilience benefits, there's strong economic advantages to be gained from, from implementing these recovery measures. And there's ample analysis and evidence to support this. You know, the falling cost of renewables is frequently discussed and has been discussed um, several times this week. You know, analysis by New Climate Economy established that strong climate action has the potential to generate over 65 million jobs um, by 2030. So I guess at its most simple, the message is that what is good for climate and resilience is also good for recovery. Uh, to illustrate this, on this slide is a, a rapid assessment framework that we're developing that can support countries to simultaneously assess low carbon and re, um, resilient recovery interventions against the characteristics um, of what could be called good, a good recovery. So short implementation timeline, high uh, labour intensity, skills development, high economic multiplier. Uh, and contributions to a productive asset base. And then long-term criteria, supporting long-term transformation and delivering positive environmental and social outcomes. Now this framework needs to be tailored uh, to a specific country or region, but what this hypothetical example clearly shows is that a combination of me measures or a package can collectively meet 
medium term um, stimulus and recovery needs as well as bring those transformational changes that I talked about. And this is very much echoed in a study that was published in May this year, which surveyed uh, 231 central bank officials and finance ministry officials on possible recovery interventions. And it clearly recommends five key intervention areas that perform well both in terms of long run uh, economic multiplier and high positive impact, including clean physical infrastructure, building efficiency, investments in education and training, natural capital investment, and clean R&D spending, or rural support schemes spending for low and middle income countries. So what's ADB's role in um, helping its developed member countries with this? You know, firstly, we need to continue um, our efforts to mainstream climate and resilience, both in lending and non-lending work, including uh, our work on aligning our operations with the Paris Agreement and working towards our climate finance targets. And on this, I'm pleased to report that in the period January to May this year, despite trying circumstances, ADB still approved over $850 million um, in climate financing. Secondly, we need to look to support DMCs to identify this package of measures that can collectively provide required stimulus and address underlying barriers to ensure that these changes are sustained. Um, I'm conscious of how much time I have, so I won't go through each of these in detail, um, but it's important to note as well that we don't have to start from, from zero. Um, you know, countries have current investment plans um, and other relevant plans under climate change frameworks such as their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, which are currently being updated. Uh, and we can build on these and leverage these um, and leverage ADB's existing support around these and other measures such as climate and disaster risk financing um, to help countries to incorporate climate change uh, resilience and low carbon development into the COVID recovery. So I guess just to wrap up and to wrap up the sessions before we move on to, to the panel, you know, the other speakers today have discussed COVID impacts on specific sectors or solutions and technologies. And all of this needs to be factored into decision-making. Um, but what's critical is that we need to start from the point of view where we're building long-term resilience, uh, climate and disaster resilience and driving transformational change towards decarbonisation. And um, that needs to be central in all decision making. So with that, um, I'll leave it there. Thank you and pass back to Christine. Thank you so much, Kate. That's a wonderful summary of a lot of the thought provoking topics that we've gone through today. And, you know, if I felt like it was a really good uh, soul searching that we've done. Um, I think you're right that, you know, every decision that we make, every stimulus measure, every policy, every financing that we provide, every technology that we're going to enable will determine whether we're going to um, raise that temperature uh, one or one degree higher or lower. So I think every decision that we make ha has to really um, contribute towards that green recovery. Now, while climate change has not taken a break, the pandemic has given us pause to reimagine our future. And thank you to all our panelists for getting us thinking about how we can build back better going forward in the new normal. Next, I would like to begin our panel discussion um, and followed by Q&A with our clean energy colleagues here today. So first, the first question I'd like to pose is, COVID-19 has exposed the vulnerabilities of our traditional systems and approaches. Yet through innovations and technologies and business models, we have discovered new ways to improve our health and the environment in the post COVID-19 world. Through indoor air quality smart sensors, affordable electric vehicles for deliveries, medical waste microwave systems and smart cities. What have led to the innovations in your respective industries in response to COVID-19? With that, I'd like to invite Rajasri to begin the panel discussion. 
Rajashi. Uh, thank you, Christine. Um, well, there are so many inventions I can uh, think of that I have uh, become aware of recently. But uh, one very interesting uh, mega trend that I'm seeing in the mobility and automotive world is this increased focus on uh, cleanliness and uh, sanitizing uh, the, uh, the vehicles. Uh, so there are examples uh, from China, for example, where uh, what requires two hours of scrubbing uh, can be done in five minutes with uh, ultraviolet cleaning of buses. Uh, another good example uh, from various uh, uh, ride hailing providers, uh, my friends, uh, is that uh, they, have, they have now resorted to ozone to uh, do thorough cleaning uh, of their vehicles. And uh, all these solutions you could not have thought of uh, just uh, pre-COVID. So very accelerated uh, and very exciting. Thanks. Thank you, Rajeshree. That's really interesting uh, on some of the high-tech high um, responses to, to COVID. Uh, can I next invite um, Mehmet to share your innovation? Mehmet? Yeah. Uh, this pandemic showed us the necessity of acting quickly, which is a subject startups are doing on a daily basis. And on the nature, because of the nature of startups, uh, they can implement uh, very innovative solutions more quickly than the big, bigger companies, big, biggest companies. Therefore, uh, every dollar a startup makes can now improve our reaction time as a society for upcoming risks, including pandemics. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thanks, Mehmet. Um, can I invite Rajashi as well to share from your perspective, some of the innovations that you have come across in your industry. And, uh, oh, Rajasri, sorry, you answered already. Uh, next, we have Khalid. Khalid, please go, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think um, because of the use of um, the PPEs, such as masks and gowns, uh, there has been uh, innovation, again, using mm. a, a microwave technology whereby um, the masks and uh, gowns could actually be reused. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so systems have been invented uh, whereby uh, from use of mask, you place it back into a, a small uh, microwave system and the mask could be used up to three times. So again, this in the rush of everybody trying to buy more PPEs, um, uh, more uh, gowns for the frontliners, this could be a, a big cost saving for hospitals and um, and um, institutions that use such PPEs. And this technology directly has been developed from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and is available and has been tested, is available now in the market. Wow, that's really interesting. And of course, we won't try that at home with our microwave. <laughs> no, definitely Next, not. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, thank you, Khalid. And next, um, Ms. Mr. Pandey, can I invite you to share your thoughts? Thank you, Christine. Uh, actually, uh, in this uh, COVID-19, we came up with a good solution that is uh, e-commerce website for energy storage. And uh, so this was our initiative in COVID-19 because we were getting many calls from the consumers. They were not able to buy the things, uh, batteries from the market because of this pandemic. So we came up with a new e-commerce site, which is up now, and we are providing from batteries, the power solutions from uh, remote cells to your car batteries, everything online nowadays. And if, if you want to buy any car batteries or anything, you can uh, just order online and you can buy, uh, the person will come to your place and they will fit. So you don't have to go to any place to do all the things. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Pandey. Yeah. Next, I would like to um, just reference going back to Antonio's presentation. We earlier saw the importance of push and pull levers, such as changing policies, regulations, tax incentives, and subsidies, which governments can utilize to enable a green build back. In your respective markets and sectors, what are some good examples of government policies or actions that you have seen? or wish to see that can propel a country's low carbon transformation as part of its COVID-19 stimulus. 
If I can invite Antonio and Kate to share your thoughts. Antonio, please start. I had a problem to unmute me. Uh, okay, so maybe I would like to share a, a, a study that I was involved in recently uh, about um, energy efficiency financing uh, to show that you need the pull and push we mentioned before, but also you need the ecosystem to be in place. So in this study, uh, what we found out is that there are two major uh, energy efficiency channels. One is direct financing, and this is usually most uh, suitable for industry transformation sector. So projects are big that they pay back for by themselves. And then you need the aggregators uh, that are typically required for fragment sectors like uh, buildings, commercial, food and beverage. These are uh, SMEs that the project has more. So you really need the aggregator to make it happen. And now it, the ecosystem is, uh, so you need the finance but you need the implementer and for energy efficiency, for example, is um, the ESCO, the energy service companies. And also you need the regulation. Now, if uh, we look uh, around, there are a few good examples that uh, other countries could think about it. So I think the cement industry in Thailand and Vietnam. So both Thailand and Vietnam have announced that they will put mandatory energy efficiency regulation in force. It is a, is a push that will result in major in companies in doing investment on energy efficiency. We have seen something similar in Malaysia and Turkey on the commercial sectors, where again, there are uh, mandatory energy efficiency regulations that, they, that has created a strong pipeline of projects and there are existing local aggregators. So there are commercial banks that are already used to work for energy efficiency. So this I think is a good example of uh, uh, push and pull plus ecosystem all together that works and maybe countries that have not embarked yet in these uh, uh, system ideas, they could think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Kate? Thanks, Christine. Um, you know, a lot of my thoughts echo what Antonio said and I talked in my earlier presentation about making sure that um, the recovery is about a package of interventions that look at you know um, immediate needs for stimulus along with long-term transformation and uh, I think you can look at push and pull and there's a lot of complementary measures that can work together to achieve that so you know example might be uh, financial incentives um, that can happen quickly like low interest loans or grants for, for low carbon and, and um, resilient building programs um, or fiscal reforms like uh, looking at import duties on solar panels or um, other such reforms. Um, and then things like standards. So in introducing resilience standards such as climate and disaster risk considerations into road standards or similar so that you ensure that uh, stimulus measurement, uh, uh, stimulus investments take that long-term resilience into account. Um, and, Longer term, you know, you have issues like removal of fossil fuel subsidies or introductions of carbon pricing that are also uh, needed to make sure that you create the right conditions for that long term transformation. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate. That's great. And then if I can also invite um, uh, our panelists to share their thoughts as well. Rajashi, can I start with you? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, what is uh, very uh, important to note here is the whole uh, how you how you manipulate the drivers of push and pull. Now we saw during the credit crunch uh, of two thousand eight two thousand ten that was a excessive push towards uh, a what you call cash for clunkers or replacement of uh, cars, and uh, that led the demand until two thousand nineteen. But we already saw in two thousand nineteen the demand was uh, almost dying. Uh, what I like with the German example is, uh, is very interesting. So you have 9,000 euros incentive for uh, going electric, but there is no sort of uh, push uh, like the credit crunch era, uh, despite uh, the demand from the lobbies. And I think this is, this is, this is very central that the policy has to have the right objectives, the right green objectives, 
uh, in these difficult times. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I, I think you bring up uh, very interesting points in terms of incentive. Uh, just to share that um, what led to the purchase of our first uh, electric vehicle or hybrid uh, in the US, uh, which was the Prius, was thanks to government incentives to get that uh, going. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Mamet to share your thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Uh, most, of most of the regulations have been related to the hospitality industry up to now. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most interesting example uh, is coming from Singapore government. One example could be the clean stamp initiative from the Singapore government. Hotels need to meet seven criteria to clean stamp covering topics from hygiene management to HVAC maintenance. We will see more countries and industries introducing new stamps or acts to regulate indoor environments. However, most of these updates could be costly, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. Therefore, I wish to see a stronger push for incentives towards building retrofits, especially covering small, medium-sized commercial buildings. While building check mechanisms for new normal, we have a great chance ahead, ahead to double or even triple the rate of renovation of the existing building stock and make them more energy efficient, more healthier, more smart. Thank you. Thank you. Khalid? Um, I think um, basically in the waste industry, there is of course the waste to energy uh, projects and there's a drive towards uh, reducing uh, methane emissions from uh, landfills and dump sites. And in Asia, we have a, a very big uh, issue, I think, um, in most of the developing countries where uh, unfortunately, most of waste is still going to such uh, um, dump sites. Um, so the encouragement or incentives to bring more um, uh, better technologies such as waste to energy um, with good pollution control systems, um, such incentives I think is critical for, for big uh, waste uh, producing countries. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, unfortunately, uh, almost 90 odd percent of municipal waste still ends up in dump sites or landfills. Uh, we do not have um, uh, sufficient or or we do not have, do not have technology waste to energy technologies yet uh, catering for the country so we need more policies that encourage um, reduction of waste going to landfills and dam sites thank you thank you Khalid Mr Pandey I completely agree with uh, Khalid. As he said, we are seeing in the Asian countries as well as in India, the same thing is happening. So we are looking for the same initiative and the policies from the government for the waste management and uh, all these things. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I, I want to get your thoughts. In the new normal, um, as Antonio had mentioned, Businesses will need to navigate a changing world with reduced or remote workforce, disrupted supply chains, low oil prices, and prolonged physical distancing. What have been some of your favorite hacks or workarounds that have enabled your businesses to thrive under the new, new, the new normal? What's been your secret recipe? Can I invite Antonio's to start? Sure. Um, you can hear me, yes. Okay, so if I give an example of uh, McKinsey, so we are a consulting company. So uh, what we have noticed in this period is that uh, our clients' perceptions work uh, of delivery has changed. So in this period, uh, we have been able to deliver 100% of our project in a full remote setup without uh, affecting the quality of work and timeline. That, that is, you know, that's very, important because before that we never thought we could deliver a project 100% in a remote way. But above all, the client has accepted this new way to work with consultants and also accept the video conference tools that uh, is a great tool because uh, they recognize the benefit that in a new normal, they can have access to global expertise in a Zoom way. Uh, so if I take uh, this uh, audience today, we have Christine from San Francisco 
that maybe if we were just for a meeting, she will not fly for this meeting, just one meeting. But I would dare to ask uh, Chrissy, what time is it now there? But this is a good way of Zoom that you can have uh, the expert at the time you need it and when you need it. And uh, this is uh, very important because we know that this will stay post COVID in the consulting world and the, the way we operate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. Rajashi? Uh, yes, Christine, sorry. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to give you uh, an, an, a something that I've been doing for a few years now. Uh, and this is in a way uh, a hack for uh, involving uh, women and diverse leaders uh, in the team. So what I tend to do is uh, I, I never sort of micromanage. Uh, nobody has to uh, give me the details of uh, how uh, they achieve something, but uh, we keep it to the achievements and uh, we, we allow extreme remote working. So uh, best example is I'm sitting in Amsterdam, whereas uh, my company is based in Germany and it has always been like that. Uh, so this really allowed us this smooth shift into uh, the, the COVID era as well, that uh, we could continue working without any sort of change in uh, the, uh, the, the sort of communication style or uh, uh, socio-emotional uh, aspect of our working together. Thanks. Mamet. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, under the normal, clear air becomes an asset which could even soon start taking part in real estate leasing purchasing contracts, while cleaner air becomes a competitive advantage for companies from retail to banking to attract more customers and increase loyalty, transfer becomes a key differentiator. Imagine when choosing which supermarket to shop, people now will be able to look for transparency in terms of indoor air, and perhaps they will be one step closer to the markets which make the indoor, quality, indoor air quality public. Our favorite hack is building the transparency between our customers and their end users in shopping malls, supermarkets, and even in banks. Measuring and optimizing indoor air is not enough. We offer various gamification and mobile interactions to help our customers to build trust and attract more customers. Thank you, Mamed. Khalid? I think the, uh, a lot of technology already exists. Um, that we have to optimize and use. And what uh, COVID-19 has taught us is that um, those potential or those uh, technologies which do exist and probably were not used before as much are now being tapped into heavily. And, and for example, we, we look at the microwave uh, systems which uh, can actually be remotely operated. Uh, sensors give uh, information on, on the production, the, the weight, how much you produce. So as we move forward, we need to rely more on tech uh, to give us uh, the opportunity to be able to deal in such situations as we've had with uh, COVID. So a, a technology does exist and we must just uh, optimize and, and use what, what we have. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Pandey. Yeah, so uh, the new normal for after COVID is that we are uh, we are also operating uh, remotely nowadays. When we are seeing we have the uh, our team is uh, operating normally from their homes and they are previously we we used to gather all a single at a single place to discuss about everything. But now we are discussing online as uh, our one team is sitting in China, one team is sitting in USA. But now. Previously, I used to go everywhere, but now I don't have any, any other go. So I have to sit at my place and we are operating everything. And it is now we can see that it is going smoothly. So wonderful. This, but yeah. Thank you. So without, without going anywhere, we are doing uh, business from sitting at our place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I know. And efficient. Yeah. I know, and uh, it's quite amazing how um, with this crisis, what uh, it has gifted us is uh, our ASEF this year has been held virtually, and now we are a 4,000 member strong clean energy community. So it, it's uh, really quite a, a blessing to have that. And last but not least, Kate. Thanks, Christine. 
Yeah, you know, um, I guess the lockdown has been really difficult and, and much more difficult for some groups than others, but um, it's also left, uh, led to quite a lot of positive benefits. So, you know, clean air and a temporary reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So I guess if we wanna get some of these behaviors to stick, um, we, we need to look at how businesses have been able to thrive um, and continue, as Antonio pointed out, um, and see that you know emission intensive activities are, are not necessarily always essential. So as he said, travel, you know, air travel, but also day-to-day -day travel to and from the workplace, um, lighting and air conditioning, huge commercial buildings, and even maybe reevaluating our approach to consuming, you know, that we haven't been able to have things available and on demand um, during COVID like we did. So I guess going forward under a new normal, we need to achieve a balance, um, you know, because people don't want to live in a lockdown scenario forever. But I think there's certainly some of the changes um, that we've seen that we can look to sustain. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all of your personal hacks. I, I will keep all of those in mind. Um, next, I, I'd like to open up uh, our panel discussion. Uh, we've received a lot of uh, really thought-provoking questions from the audience. Um, I will try to uh, have all of these answered as much as we can under our time limit. Um, first, the, one of the questions that came from the audience is about uh, policy change, as we have you know, discussed how you know, policy stimulus can really you know, play a pivotal role in how we're going to drive our future. Now, the question is how policy changes can work not only for our immediate crisis that we're in, but also for the next crisis, which is going to be about climate change. So I'd like to um, open the floor up for, for um, sharing your thoughts on this. Um, I, I know Antonio, this is probably a topic that uh, you, you probably would have uh, some insights on if I could start with you. Sure. Uh, okay, first I would uh, recommend the audience to read one article that we just published that is on uh, how a post-pandemic stimulus can both create jobs and the climate. Uh, some of the slides come from the article. So the key point is uh, stimulus. So we have recovery packages. Some are dedicated to recover now to support some uh, portion of, of the economy. But uh, the policies should be for a lo medium long term, should not be for the next two months. So, so the policy in place should look after uh, the long term. And what we have shown with the European country case is that you can have policies that both helps the economy and the helps the environment. So it can be done. And then if we look backwards, so if we look at the 2007, 2008, when we had the financial crisis, what happens, emissions went down, uh, but then in 2010, the emissions reached a record high. That, the main reason was because government implemented measures to stimulate economies, but with limited regard for the environmental consequences. So at that time, you know, the focus was, oh, I need to restart my economy. So it was what is best for the economy. But what we are showing now, that we, six years, seven years later, climate change is becoming a topic. Uh, we have a 2015 Paris Agreement where we say the global warming, we need to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what we have seen is that it's possible to have policies that both support economy and climate. So this is possible. So it's not important. We should think on that way. Uh, maybe one last second is if I take an example of China, you have seen that they have a, a stimulus where it says uh, electrical vehicles. That, that is uh, good in the sense that you, you stimulate electrical vehicles. So you, you replace uh, uh, emissions from the transport of with co in, internal combustion engines, but you do need to make sure the electricity comes from clean forms. So that is what is important policies to be clear, you know, when you do the full value chain, you need to consider the full value chain when you do policies. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. I, I understand that we're, uh, we just have, you know, so much to discuss today and we could go on and on, but unfortunately we were uh, short on timing. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to the ASEF organizers and all of our clean energy colleagues for making this such a, impactful discussion that we've had today. Now, equipped with Antonio's and Kate's frameworks, 
and frontline stories from around the world that you've heard from Rajashi, Mehmet, Khalid, and Mr. Pandey, I hope you will leave inspired on how we can combat both the pandemic and climate change. Now, unprecedented times call for unprecedented response. So let's continue to innovate together under the new normal and make our green bounce back a reality for developing Asia. Now, speaking of innovation, I'm thrilled to turn over to my colleague who will be hosting the next segment to this session. So please hang on. Stephen Peters is our senior energy specialist from ADB Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, who has been the chief architect behind this amazing panel and our resident waste expert. He will be introducing to you ADB's innovation challenge that was announced by President Massa during ASEF's opening. With that, I would like to thank everyone for being part of our wonderful panel today. Thank you.
Hello everyone, my name's Steve Peters. I'm here to talk to you about the online challenge. And what I'd like to do now is introduce Ozia Khan, who is the Senior Director at ITD for Innovation. And over to you, Ozia, to tell us about the challenge. Thank you. Um, I work on the technology side of the house at uh, ADB. Um, when COVID-19 hit us, uh, pretty much everyone started coming to us with ideas and solutions, as you were hearing in the previous uh, panel sessions on technology and how technology, technology can be leveraged uh, on this uh, fight against uh, COVID. So we decided to organize this under a hackathon umbrella to match solutions and challenges and ideas. Uh, we launched the Digital Against COVID Hackathon under uh, ADB Digital Innovation Sandbox Program. This year is 100% virtual. Uh, last couple of years, we had more physical hackathons. This year, we went all uh, virtual in partnership with Asian Institute of Management. The focus is on digital ideas and solutions for this fight against COVID-19. The Sandbox provides a safe and neutral place to experiment, test with real pilots with ADB support. Under this program, we can go from idea to real pilot fast um, with, of course, guardrails. This approach allows us for um, innovation to happen fast in a way with freedom from a lot of the current policies and other sort of current state best practices that uh, don't allow uh, innovation fast. Uh, it it uh, also supports you with uh, uh, frameworks around uh, cloud and other technology provisions that are required to make uh, uh, these uh, experiments uh, to occur faster. The hackathon this year is looking at more medium to long, longer term uh, normal for us, uh, 2021 and beyond. Uh, it will focus uh, for more than just sort of adapting to COVID-19, but looking at shaping our, our uh, new normal. Like in the discussion before, that this, this, this question of pause today has given us a possibility, almost like a reboot moment, uh, but it requires a super fast innovation. And how do you, how do you make super fast innovation happen? Uh, this is where we're looking at crowdsourcing, we're looking at uh, matching challenges and ideas and put them through on a fast track for experimentation. Uh, and this allows for, of course, local and global innovation to mix. Uh, and, 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 and to provide us uh, 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 an opportunity to shape the new normal. Uh, in many cases, when I was hearing ideas and solutions, I, I was looking at it from the lens that this doesn't really uh, go with the current best practices. So we have to develop sort of next best practices and, and fairly fast. Uh, I, I was also looking at the portfolio of ideas coming our way and it was more than just work from home and, and managing social distances. There, there was another sort of um, uh, underlying theme to this. So this is the uh, time to change. Uh, and this is where when you look at, uh, I mean, if, if you look today at health and well-being and what's happening, the role of data and AI in this fight, you, you, you see it on a daily basis, numbers, data, big data making a difference in, in health and well-being. Education, everyone was caught off guard overnight, went digital. Some did faster than the others. When you look at economic recovery, micro, small institutions, they're looking at ways to recover faster using tech. Uh, government services, including ADP, our own digital transformation is, is now put on sort of super speed uh, uh, to, to, to happen. So we launched this hackathon uh, uh, platform to enable uh, acquisition of challenges, to match with ideas and solutions and to nurture them in a sandbox environment which is safe, neutral, with support from ADB, with, with, with tech support, but also support on the policy side, on, on uh, regulatory uh, policies, so that we can safely test a new idea together with everyone uh, uh, to fast track for implementation to discover our, our, our new normal possibilities. So, so that's really sort of the, the, the genesis in terms of how we embarked on this. We're uh, a month or so into it, and already we're seeing a lot of fruit in terms of uh, matching challenges, matching solutions, and, and moving ahead forward. Uh, I'll stop here and I'll pass it over to Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ozir. That's very kind of you. Um, first of all, everybody, I hope you're all okay wherever you are and that you and your family and your colleagues are safe. This challenge started out of an initial discussion 
um, prompted by a newspaper report from China talking about how waste was to, uh, being processed in cement kilns. And in fact, the session that we just had today is a result of three months work and discussions between Christine, who was very active in supporting this from the private sector side, and some of the other folks in the presentation who were very active in engaging, notably Khalid. So um, where do we go from here? Where do we take the response from COVID-19? We've talked about large infrastructure in our work. Now we need to figure out what's a low hanging fruit we can work on. And that low hanging fruit is actually digitizing waste collection. It's been done before. There are people using these programs and people developing and using apps, but it's fragmented. And what we'd like to do is try and run a program to find out about what innovation is available, to share our views on where that innovation will go, and also to talk about how we can integrate apps into the larger activities of governments in terms of extended producer responsibility schemes. So let me start from EPR. Taipei China has a fantastic scheme of, uh, using EPR. It was actually started out of the community. A number of manufacturers decided that they wanted to deal with their waste. And so they grouped together and said, okay, from all the waste from these factories will be processed by another factory, which we will fund and subsidize from the sales of our products. This then led on to a number of active, a number of those types of arrangements. And then the government formalized that into a what is now called the Taiwan Funds Recycling Funds Management Board. So that handles a process where uh, people pay a fee to release a product either manufactured or imported into the market. That fee is then distributed to the manufacturers, uh, to the recyclers and to those people that handle the waste. That program generates revenue and actually generates a profit of about 20% for the government. So when you say that waste can't be managed profitably, this is in fact incorrect. So how do we then get that information about what is available in countries which are fragmented or don't have the capacity to implement that system quickly or thoroughly? Well, of course, it's the community. Now, this is what the apps are already trying to do. Apps are already trying to organise communities, do waste trading banks, identify uh, sources of, of waste, and try and determine where waste can be dealt with in the lowest impact possible. Zero waste communities, all of these sorts of activities are driven from these, uh, these types of apps. The challenge is how do we link those apps to a subsequent extended producer responsibility scheme, which we think governments are going to do because it's a way for them to generate revenue. And it's also a way for them to guarantee sanitation and to create a, a nicer and more resilient environment for their citizens to live in. So what we want to hear in this challenge is about the innovation that's occurring in the marketplace. I've reached out to a number of people as have some of the other people in the challenge. We are very keen to hear about your innovation, even if it doesn't exactly fit what I just described because innovation sometimes is about giving something to somebody they don't really know they need. So from that end, um, I would highly recommend talking to your friends and colleagues and putting a team together for this challenge. The website is available. If you don't have the website, please reach out to us. We will, I believe that the website will be, uh, will be published on ADB's main website as well. Um, if not, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. My name is Stephen Sturrock Peters uh, on LinkedIn, and you'll see that I'm at the Asian Development Bank. I encourage you to, to take part in this challenge. Uh, I'm really keen to hear about the work you're doing, however small. Even if you think we're too small to take part in this challenge, please don't. So from that end, I'd like to thank you all for your time and for staying around after this session. I'd like to thank Ozir and the nice people at ITD for their great support in this. And I'd like to support, uh, thank the people involved in the team in developing this challenge, including Christine and a number of other folks who are not on camera at the moment. And from that end, I thank you. I wish you well on the challenge and I look forward to seeing your innovation 
and hoping we can share it to make a safer, more resilient world. Thank you very much.